Hello, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Community Conservation. My name is Sarah Armstrong, and I'm the Marketing Manager at Oregon Wildlife Foundation. I'll be hosting our discussion here today. For those of you who are new to the foundation, we're an organization who have been dedicated to funding statewide conservation work since 1981. We wanted to find a way to stay connected and continue the conversation around critical conservation work in Oregon. So we created the series to facilitate that and to keep our mission at the forefront of the work that we do. So if you're interested in understanding Oregon's wolverines and want to keep our dedicated researchers in the field, I encourage you to make a donation in the box below or to text the word Wolverine to 41444. Today's topic, of course, is wolverines, a potentially mysterious creature to some, and definitely a curious creature to all, especially considering that their large habitat and migration range makes observation of the species challenging. So to explain more about this animal, their habitat, and one special wolverine in particular are our Wallawa Wolverine Project field researchers, Scott Shively and Kayla Dreyer. Hi, welcome. Hey. Hi. Hey, Sarah. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks so much for being here. Um, I'm wondering if, Scott, maybe you want to start us off, and Kayla as well, if you could introduce yourself a little bit further, explain your background. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm Scott Shively. I'm the project coordinator for the Willow Wolverine Project. I've um, been working in the wildlife field since about 2011 um, as a wildlife technician and field biologist, uh, working on various projects with uh, mostly with raptors and forest carnivores. Um, and recently, or most recently, uh, since we've teamed up with the foundation for this Wallawa Wolverine study, uh, Kayla and I have been working together uh, in the Washington Cascades, studying Cascade red foxes and wolverines uh, in Southern Washington, both for the Forest Service and for the nonprofit Cascades Carnivore Project. This is all in the last five years. Yeah. Um... And so we are technically contract field biologists for the Oregon Wildlife Foundation. Um, and as Scott said, we started out um, our careers working for the Forest Service, um, studying fox and wolverines. And um, I also work for Mount Rainier National Park and am currently a graduate student at the University of Washington. So Scott and Kayla, can you please tell me what are wolverines? Yeah, so wolverines are mid-sized carnivores uh, in the weasel family. They're actually the largest land-based uh, member of the weasel family, weighing 25 to 35 pounds, maybe sometimes 40 pounds up in, in far northern latitudes. Um, sea otters are a little bit bigger than that. They're the, the largest mustelid. Um, and wolverines are very well adapted to snowy climates. They, they have large snowshoe-like paws. They can travel through snowy environments really well. Uh, and they're, they're linked to those colder, snowy habitats for a lot of different reasons for denning uh, and reproductive um, stuff and uh, food caching and other, other things like that. Yeah, and so wolverines, they're, they're primarily scavengers. And um, so they, wolverines exploit a really unproductive, um, uh, unproductive um, um, habitat. So like you think of high elevation, well, in the lower 48, you think wolverine habitat is at the high elevations, which are um, because they're the snowiest, coldest places. Um, and so in these, uh, they stay year round at these high elevations. And so in these, um, in these habitats, there aren't a lot of other species for wolverines to prey on. So they're primarily scavengers. And so um, wolverines will, they have very large home ranges that, um, that they, uh, they have very large home ranges that they defend their territorial. Um, and so uh, that's because these, these habitats, there are not a lot of prey species to go around. And so they scavenge carcasses, which are not very abundant on landscapes usually. Um, so you described their habitat and you said that they're in that habitat year round. Do they ever hibernate? No, they're active, yeah, all winter, and they kind of need to be. It's like food resources are pretty scarce during the winter times. You know, a lot of larger ungulates are, are down in lower elevations, um, and so they're either hunting, you know, the few small mammals that are out during the winter, snowshoe hares, some, some small rodents, um, but it's mostly scavenging, and they can, they can smell uh, avalanche-killed ungulate carcasses under avalanche debris, so they'll cruise cirques and basins and uh, they can dig out carcasses from underneath the snow or um, access animals that were killed like in the fall 
and they'll dig down and uh, and access food resources all oh my around. gosh how, how do you do you happen to know how far they can dig down well actually um, we've come across a handful of caches with our um, our previous work in the South Cascades um, for the Forest Service and there was um, a really neat find uh, a cache that we had baited a station with a deer head at the beginning of the season um, and so uh, in the springtime we found the cache that the um, this female wolverine had stored this deer head at and um, it was a hole that was about 13 feet deep. The Cascades have extremely deep snowpack mm -hmm. and um, we knew it was that deep because um, there was a rock that had been brought up with this deer head to the to the <laughs> top of the snowpack. Um, so yeah, it's very impressive. Um, a lot of, uh, there's um, GPS data from other studies that have collared wolverines that show wolverines just um, following the, the bottoms of um, avalanche slide paths. And so they, it's a, a hunting strategy, uh, um, a scavenging mm -hmm. strategy to follow the bottom of this, this avalanche debris to dig down to see um, if there are uh, carcasses that are underneath that they can smell. Um, what? That's crazy. <laughs> so, okay, they can go down apparently very low. And I've also seen Wolverine or pictures, pictures of Wolverines in trees, so they can go low and they can go up in trees, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, they can climb pretty well. It's not, they're, they're not an arboreal species by any sense, um, but they can climb trees to get away from, from uh, predators, you know, wolf packs and stuff. Um, and also just maybe to get a view um, and see what's out there. And, and so that's, it kind of plays in, we can talk about that later, but what the, the method we use is actually a, a structure um, with our camera stations is, is usually about eight, 10, 12 feet up in a tree. Um, so that when the snowpack's high, it doesn't get buried, but also they're, on, they're one of the only uh, carnivores that can climb up there uh, and get photographed. So we don't get you know, coyotes and foxes yeah. up the trees to, on, our, on our stations. Wow, that's, that's pretty wild. Well, okay, I think it's time to talk about my favorite Wolverine and maybe Oregon's only Wolverine, Stormy. Can you introduce Stormy to us? Yeah, so Stormy is... Uh, kind of the lone wolverine of the Wallowas uh, right now. And, and for a long time, he's, he's the only known wolverine in the state at this point. And he was first photographed in the Wallowas in 2011 um, as part of a, a wolverine study that was kind of the precursor to our, our current effort here. Um, and in that study, uh, it was done by a wolverine researcher named Audrey McGowan, who did, uh, she's been studying wolverines since the 80s, kind of early on before there was a, a whole lot known about wolverines and did most of her work in Alaska and Canada and then kind of semi-retired down to Northeast Oregon. And we're looking at the Wallowas off their back porch thinking, man, this looks like good wolverine habitat. There's gotta be wolverines here, you know? And so uh, they put out some cameras and, and yeah, found three wolverines right off the bat and then kind of kicked off um, a two-year study with the Oregon Wildlife Foundation actually funded that that initial effort. So, so you're saying that was that was some intuition? <laughs> they just looked out and thought, you know what, looks like wolverines might be out here, and they happened to get them on camera or happened to see them. Yeah, yeah. She. Well, yeah, wolverine. Like the Wallowas are um, historically they um, were thought to be wolverine uh, habitat and. Um, Wolverines experienced a really um, widespread range retraction in the lower 48 because of um, trapping and um, just widespread predator removal campaigns um, of the 1900s. And um, but uh, before wolverines were known to be in the Wallowas, there was a known um, reproductive population of wolverines in um, in Idaho, um, and so that's that population was only um, like less than a hundred miles from the Wallowas. And so there was really no reason to believe that Wolverines wouldn't be able to disperse and establish, um, establish territories in the Wallowas. Cool. So Stormy is up there apparently by, by himself right now, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's pretty interesting that you can have a male uh, in an area like that, seemingly by himself for you know almost ten years now, because so there were, there were two other individuals photographed in 2011, and they've since disappeared, never never returned, and so it's just been Stormy by himself. So it's kind of interesting, you know, what was going on before that? Was there you know maybe a breeding female there in years prior um, that that moved on or died, 
um, or were those just happen to be dispersing individuals all of a sudden and in, in all three in the same place? So, yeah. Like maybe they were friends. Do you, do you happen to know if they were around the same age, maybe of the same clan or whatever, if they, maybe they travel together or anything? So, so Stormy was identified as a, as an adult male. So he was, you know, fully developed. Um, and so at least two years old. And one of the other ones uh, was he looked like a young male, and one of them couldn't be sexed conclusively. So you know, could have been a. a... But from a few photos, he looked like he. It was likely a, a young male as well. Um, gotcha. Only got yeah. Audrey only got genetics off of Stormy, um, and so couldn't say you know if or how he was related to those other two Wolverines. So they're not friends anymore. Stormy's out there by himself. How uh, how old is Stormy now? He's got to be close to 12 years old. I mean, he could be, yeah, he could be even older. Yeah, at, so. at least, um, yeah, at least 11. Um, and so. And how long do they, are they expected to live? Um, well, it's, it's hard to say. There are a lot of, um, it depends on the, the area um, that they're in, but um, like wolverines in captivity live up to 20 years or so. Um, but I think like the uh, some studies averages for uh, lifespan of wolverines is around eight, eight to 10, 12 years old. Um, but there is, um, there have been wolverines in the wild that are, that live to 14 or 15. So. Wow. And what are the measurements of Stormy? How many pounds or <laughs> how, what, what's his length? Do you, do you measure head to tail? Well, no, I mean, it, this is all, most of this information is just off photographs. And that's, so that's something to note though, is, is that the methods we use is camera trapping is all non-invasive. So you're never trapping the animal. You're not actually putting hands on it. You're not putting a, a neck GPS collar on it or anything. So yeah, we, we don't know, you know, how, how much he weighs or anything. I gotcha. I want, I need to know everything now. I'm like, oh, okay. okay. So you talk about the monitoring process. Can you describe that to me? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we use a, a, a system, it's called a run pole, and it was designed by Dr. McGowan to get these diagnostic photos of wolverines. They all have unique uh, neck and chest patterns, and so you, it's like a fingerprint. So you want them to stand up and face the camera. So it's a structure on a tree, there's a, there's a horizontal pole coming outward, and the bait is cabled between your camera tree and your run pole tree. And uh, they, they, so they have to walk out on this pole and stand up, put their paws on this little frame, uh, you'll see in photos here in a minute and uh and then they look up to get the bait and climb up and eat it so you're so you're getting those you know f direct chest photos and if they they'll spread out and chew on the bait you can also um id their sex and and if you're lucky even reproductive status for females in the spring you can tell if they're lactating or not wow do they ever catch on do like when they see a station like <laughs> i have fallen for this before <laughs> Well, yeah, I think so. You know, a new Wolverine finds one of these run pull stations, like what we found in the Cascades. I mean, it, it takes a while for them to get used to it, you know, and the bait's hanging up there and they don't really want to have to teeter on this thing and, and balance and stuff. But, you know, once they get used to these stations, they'll, if they'll find a new, new to them, but, but they're, they're used to run poles and they'll just zip right up and start doing acrobatics and stuff. It's pretty, <laughs> That's awesome. but Stormy though, he, you can tell he's an old Wolverine because because you know we have videos of him and, and the stuff uh, that we've done in the Cascades, and he's not as spry as some of those other Wolverines. He's kind of gingerly walking around on those. Oh, so we no. feel yeah, we feel bad. We got to make some geriatric improvements to our run. Yeah, <laughs> a sweet old boy. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, so the the what is the monitoring process like? for you and your team, uh, what does it take for you to maybe get there or to set up the traps? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so it's pretty involved um, and we get a lot of help from our collaborators. So Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Forest Service, um, they both provide some cameras to use. Uh, we have cameras from Audrey as well. Um, and we get in the, so we set all of our stations in the fall, kind of you're kind of racing the snow um, and set them up the last minute usually hiking and we got a lot, uh, a bunch of stock support from the state. Um, and so they packed us in on horses for several of our sites. It's a huge help because we're carrying a big, huge elk head um, or cow femurs and, and trying to get bait and all these cameras and gear way into the wilderness. And so you, you hike in right in on the fall and set them. And then uh, in the winter time, we'll snowmobile. We have snowmobiles to use um, borrowed from ODFW as well. Uh, and then ski or snowshoe in to, to do your winter checks. And then they'll, they'll come down in the summertime. The pictures look so beautiful. <laughs> like, I mean, it looks like a beautiful landscape out there of you guys. I'm sure it's very cold. Yeah. Oh yeah. 
Yeah, and we, we work all throughout the, the Eagle Cap wilderness and, and it's a 500 square mile area and we have about um, 12 camera stations um, distributed out there across the major drainages. And Wow, so how many days or how many weeks are you up there at a time? Um, well, it just depends. I mean, we, we uh, half of those stations, they're so remote or the, the routes are avalanche prone that they'll stay out all winter. We'll set them in the fall and we won't touch them until the summertime, but we'll, we'll check five to seven stations just depending on conditions and, and access. Um, so we might, we might spend uh, a week or two in the area, not, not camped out or anything. We'll do some day trips, maybe some overnight trips to get those sites, but we'll do two or three checks over the winter time, ideally. Um, kind of once a month and, and get in there and refresh the bait, uh, change batteries on the cameras, download the SD card, stuff like that. How did the fall camera deployment go? Yeah, uh, camera deployments went great. We got everything set in the month of October. Um, we set 11 stations uh, with the help of ODFW again, packed us in on horseback to several sites uh, and then yeah, hiked out. So we got, we got everything running now and we're just gonna leave them for several months, let them do their thing. And we'll go back in probably mid January uh, and check them maybe one to three times uh, over the course of the winter and then take them down in the summer. But the the good news from the fall was that on our last day of, of camera sets, we actually cut semi-fresh wolverine tracks. Uh, and so it's pretty exciting to know that it's, it's most likely stormy out there, um, but it's exciting to know that, yeah, there's a wolverine roaming out there as we speak. Hopefully. Wow. But you don't know just by the look of, I mean, you, I guess you would be eyeballing it, but you don't know just by the size or whatever, if it is stormy or somebody else. Well, actually, so funny. So something about stormy, you can see in a lot of our photos that when he climbs up on a run pole is he's actually missing some toes or, or maybe one and a half toes here. He, he got caught in a leg hold trap uh, back in 2012. Um, it was a, a bobcat trap and he was by catching it. And the trapper called the state right away and they drove out and drugged him and were able to release him uh, and wait, wait around for him to kind of come to. And, but over the course of the winter showing up on Audrey's cameras, you could tell those toes weren't doing so well and kind of starting to fall off. So anyway, so we've got, he's like this three toed Wolverine on his, on his right front paw. So I, I was looking really hard at these tracks. They're kind of old and icy, but some of the ones that should have been a right front just looked funny and looked to be kind of missing some claws, but it's just hard to tell. It, it, it's most likely him anyway, um, but it, yeah, could, could be somebody else, but it's probably Stormy. Um, that's actually a great segue for me. I have some local art here from a fourth, uh, fourth grader, fourth grade artist. Wolverine art? Wolverine art. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say wolverines are cool. I know it's back. Wolverines are cool. You know, oh, happens awesome. to have a few toes missing. What? <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Stormy's number one fan. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, that's that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cool. See. Mine. Yeah. <laughs> Future wolverine biologists there. Yeah, I guess it's kind of like a crime scene when you're looking at the you're trying to look at the shoe print or something like that for the I don't know it's whose claw is this I don't know are they fingers yeah. or are they toes are they all toes or the front ones are fingers uh, they're all toes, toes. toes. <laughs> fair enough <laughs> and what else do you see out there other than Wolverine apparently yeah um so up at these high elevations, there aren't a, a whole lot of other um, species that we come across up there. Um, and that's kind of part of the reason why um, wolverines spend year round up in these, these areas and they don't have a lot of competitors up there. And, mm -hmm. um, but we do, we come across Rocky Mountain red foxes, um, which are also a, a species that there's some conservation interest there. And so um, whenever we come across those tracks, we, or, or scats, we pick mm -hmm. those up and um, can share that information with our collaborators. Um, and then also there's a lot of Pacific Martin. We documented Pacific Martin at um, all of our camera yeah. sites um, this past year, um, sometimes three at a time, <laughs> which is pretty cute to see. Um, and then we, we had some cool uh, run-ins with uh, river otter tracks. Mm -hmm. um, oh, seriously? Like, 7,000 feet. Um, yeah. So wow. that was really neat. They go, like sliding down into uh, for underneath frozen lakes. So <laughs> yeah. Do you ever work with other research teams who might be studying that species or maybe the department or something like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's great. So this, the, you know, these, these methods getting all these different species on the cameras, we can kind of assist other studies and, and kind of tick off other 
carnivore research goals, you know, while we're, we're targeting wolverine, but we're collecting data on all these other species and, and kind of helping out um, other research questions. Yeah, for sure. Well, um, that leads me to my next question. What are your research next steps for either this project, maybe future pro or future research projects for other species? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so our, our real long-term goal um, with the Wallow Wolverine Project is to have, um, to have this long-term monitoring program that collects information on Wolverine dispersal dynamics into the Wallowas. Um, so again, it's really not that far away from um, uh, other breeding Wolverine populations, but for some reason over the last almost 10 years, there's, there hasn't been any other documented dispersal into this area. And so um, we're really wondering why that might be the case. And so, um, so our other research goals to supplement just the, like who the demographic mm -hmm. um, data that we're collecting is um, looking at the corridors uh, and um, features between here, uh, the Wallawas and um, the populations in Idaho that might be um, kind of impeding uh, dispersal um, into the Wallawas. And um, also, we're, this long-term data gives us an opportunity to see how other species might be moving up into these high elevation areas. Um, so that's a concern with uh, climate change and changing mountain ecosystems, changes in the snowpack depth, um, and other competitor species coming up into these alpine areas and competing with wolverines that could be a possible threat to um, their long-term persistence in some areas. So by having, uh, by collecting data on coyotes or um, bobcats and, and wolves and how they are, um, how they might be using uh, these different parts of our study area in the winter, we can start looking at the dynamics between wolverines and these potential competitors. And do you have other maybe research groups in different states or uh, maybe universities or I don't know where else that would that are doing similar projects like you or that maybe have already been tracking storming in a different way? Do you ever do those kinds of collaborations or nobody else is doing this? Well, it's the, the Wallows are kind of, yeah, they're kind of a, an island of, of Wolverine habitat. I mean, there's no other Wolverines known in the state. Um, but no, there are, yeah, we're pretty much wherever there's Wolverines in lower 48, somebody's studying them. There's some sort of project or monitoring going on, um, you know, whether it's agencies, forest service or, uh, or park service. Um, so there's, there's IDFG uh, folks in Idaho studying some of those populations, like in the Payette National Forest um, and, and more north in Idaho as well. And there's also a, uh, a multi-state effort to survey wolverines. They did a baseline survey in 2016, and they'll re they'll repeat it next winter, 21, 22, and it's uh, it's a whole bunch of states: Washington, uh, Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho. And, and Oregon's talking about maybe jumping on, maybe even Colorado and Utah to kind of just blitz all the wolverine habitat, you know, select grids to survey and put stations out there. So there there's definitely a lot of information coming, and they'll they'll have stations just um, east of the Snake River in that study in the Seven Devil Mountains, which is kind of a thin um, line of, of wolverine habitat there, but it's very close to the Wallowas and Wolverine's terms. So it'll be interesting to see uh, in a couple of years what comes of that study as well. Wow, so that would be like a little net, that would be like a network of people or network of stations to trying to get the data. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah, huge collaborative effort by both. Yeah, <laughs> really with wolverine conservation throughout um, the contiguous states, it's it's it is a big collaboration because um these wolverine populations down here since they're um mostly isolated mountain ranges or just segments like the rocky mountain range and then the cascades um the idea is that um all the wolverine habitat down here exists as a meta population and so it's really important to have connectivity um between and collaboration between research efforts and conservation goals between all these different groups um, so that uh, the best the best plan can be can be made to conserve them. Yeah, totally. So um, can you speak on your 2021 plans for this this specific project working on research for Stormy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this will be our second winter of monitoring. Um, we ran 14 cameras last year and we've got 11 sets so far. We may set some additional 
Um, Cameron's kind of on the periphery of the, of the EcoCap wilderness. Um, but they're already out there. We set them in October, again, with help from the state and the Forest Service. Uh, and so we're going to return uh, and check those here in the wintertime. Um, and then we'll take them down in the summer, kind of the same, same deal. Nice. Awesome. And I also want to remind everybody, too, if you want to help support this project, specifically um, for Stormy, these field researchers, be sure to donate below in the box, or you can text Wolverine to 41444. I have a few questions for you if you have, if you still have time for a little Q&A. I have questions that were submitted through email and online um, on our Facebook last week, and I think we might have covered a couple, but let me dive in here. Okay. Okay, I actually got a few of these um, people spotting Wolverine and mm. or thinking thinking that they saw Wolverine. Uh, here I have somebody that said, I spotted a Wolverine in Central Oregon near Sun River about 50 years ago. Are there ever any sightings of them in that area? Yeah, that's interesting. 50 years ago that so the the fun thing about studying Wolverines or, or uh, just monitoring is you never know where they're going to pop up. They have such large dispersal ranges that they go between, you know, a habitat that you wouldn't necessarily consider a wolverine in, they might travel through to, to try and get to another mountain range. Um, and so you get individuals making these huge dispersals popping up in sagebrush habitat or, or outside normal, you know, mountainous iconic wolverine habitat. And so it's very possible. And there's, there's actually a number of um, documented uh, wolverines, unfortunately, most of them being killed or trapped. Um, throughout kind of the late 1900s. Um, and there was one nearby there uh, on Three Finger Jack near that mountain uh, on 1965, a, a hunter shot a wolverine um, in that area near Mount Jefferson and Three Finger Jack. And then wow. in the 80s, there was one hit um, on 84 in the gorge. Um, and so they're just, they, they pop up. There's been one in, in Steens Mountain um, around the same time. And so they, you, yeah, if you think you see a Wolverine, the best thing you can do is take photos, take photos of the animal, take video of the animal. It's not always possible if you get a glimpse, but you can try and find tracks. If it's the winter time, please take photos of the tracks and not just right up against the track because it's hard to get definition. So you need something for scale and take photos of the, the, the walking pattern, the gait as well. So, because yeah, so you get so many reports of Wolverines um, that you just can't verify, um, but they very well, some of them could be Wolverines. I mean, you just never know where they're going to pop up. It's pretty cool. If somebody, yeah, if somebody thought that they saw a Wolverine, what is the second best option? If in fact it wasn't a Wolverine, what do you think that they might have seen instead? A badger, a marmot, if they're in, oh, in okay. somewhere. I mean, marmots are big. Yeah, from a distance, we've even been tripped up by marmots. <laughs> well, yeah, you're out there looking for, <laughs> looking for this one thing and yeah, right. watch marmots for for far too long, and then realize that that's yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I got a few a few people who wrote in and said um, either a long time ago when they were such and such an age or something about 50, 40, 50 years ago, they saw them in this in this uh, range. Mm -hmm. I did get a few people who said around Eagle Cap that they saw them when they were younger, maybe 40 or 50 years mm -hmm. ago, that they definitely saw wolverines when they were out there. Yeah, yeah, no, and that's and that's what what the consensus was at the time that Audrey started her study in 2010, 20, 2011. Um, you know, the biologist in the area said, yeah, we get, you know, reported sightings, you know, over the years, but nothing, no photos, nothing we can confirm. Uh, and so that kind of was what led her to, to really go out there and set a bunch of cameras. So cool. Okay, moving on. How does somebody become a wildlife biologist and researcher like Scott and Kayla? They seem to have a really interesting job. <laughs> yeah. Um well, we actually have um, kind of a non-traditional entrance into the wildlife field. Um, we both study different um, different things in um, in undergraduate, and but and we started off uh, working for a trail crew uh, with the Forest Service and as wilderness rangers as well. And um, but then we we became interested in working in the wildlife field, and so we started volunteering and um, connected with uh, a. Uh, Cascade Red Fox project in the um, South Cascades and through that just we incidentally started detecting wolverines and um, our experiences um, tracking wolverines around the South Cascades um, and coming across a couple individuals there and getting some really like intimate uh, experiences seeing these really rare animals really captivated us and 
Um, and so we just became very passionate about wolverine conservation and um, finding opportunities to, to study wolverines where there's not other research projects going on. Um, yeah, there's, um, we'll have to do, I don't know, we'll have to do a special article or blog post or something, or maybe interview. I really don't know about um, the, the beginning of this project uh, from Audrey's work on too, because I've read yeah. some of it and I've heard our executive director, Tim Gresseth, he's, um, he's spoken with me about this a couple times, but I haven't, I don't know that I've gotten the full story about this yet. Even the bits that you guys have been saying here, I am totally enamored with the idea that she just went out there I think I think I see some wolverines. I want to know more. Put up a camera, and that's a really big part of observation science too. Is um, under, or for understanding a species. I'm obviously not a um, field researcher or biologist by any means, but I think that observation is probably the first place to start. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there are a lot, um, or there are a couple really cool. Um, the the Cascades Wolverine Project up in the North Cascades in Washington. Um, they are really harnessing the power of um, recreation and sightings to inform their research and to collect some really, um, really interesting uh, data on where wolverines are, pre are present. And, um, and through that, and alongside Cascades Carnivore Project's work in Mount Rainier, which made some news um, this past summer, there were over like 10 sightings in, of this this wolverine and her, and her two kits. And so that was like very exciting for people and got people very interested. And um, just the, the data provided to um, that study from recreationists and people who just incidentally see wolverines was, was really huge in informing how the work was being conducted. So actually that might roll into the second question, uh, the frequent sightings that you were talking about. I have here a question that says, as climate change affects our environmental, our environment, especially temperatures and high altitudes, what will happen to the wolverine habitat? Um, could they ever mate and breed in warmer climate? I don't know if maybe, mm. did, do you think climate change had to do with the, the recent or I guess more frequent sightings? Um, not necessarily because um, those sightings were all at very like high elevation, like the snowpack is very, very much still there. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, like around Mount Rainier, which is like a very large <laughs> um, snowy mountain, that's that's a place that might be less affected, like very close to the mountain where they were sighted. But um, throughout the Wolverine's range, they are very much there. The den sites that have been located are um, almost always in deep snowpack. Um, and so there's no reason to believe that uh, a loss of snowpack would not have some serious effects on um, on the persistence of wolverines in some places. Um, and so there have been uh, a few studies that have documented wolverines outside, denning outside of the, uh, the um, outside of deep snow, uh, but those are, those are more rare. And so, um, and it's, if even though, even if they could find a structure to den in that might protect their kits, um, there would still be other problems with other competitors mm -hmm. and a loss of like food resources um, from co other competition um, with other species, so. Gotcha, so you think yeah. that they would just keep going farther north and farther north as maybe their climate starts to have snow melt away? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And, and in the lower 48, that wolverine habitat that's already fragmented and, and, and small, would shrink and move, you know, higher in elevation until there's just not enough to sustain, not enough connectivity um, or habitat to sustain the populations. And, you know, it's going to drive recreation, backcountry, you know, winter recreationists higher and higher and, 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 uh, and allow, you know, more conflict between winter recreation and, and wolverines. That's a good point. I actually have gotten this question a couple times. Um, people concerned about people being in wolverine's habitat or which, which I don't, I mean, I, I think it's people concerned with the recreation that people would consistently go into that area and not that they would maybe be moving or anything, but mm -hmm. can you speak to that at all? Yeah. Yeah. There's actually, there was a really neat study done um, in, in recent years uh, in Wyoming and parts of Idaho as well that was looking at, yeah, exactly winter recreation impacts on wolverines. They had collared wolverines, GPS satellite collared wolverines, and uh, so they, they were monitoring them along the landscape. And then they had winter recreationists, backcountry skiers, snowmobilers, heli-ski operations 
uh, volunteer to take GPS uh, transmitters out on their on their routes when they were skiing, snowmobiling, and having fun. And so they were able to look at you know where where are users um, recreating and then where are these wolverines and how are they responding uh, to that that recreation impact. And so there are some interesting insights to that. And really, the the most impact is going to be with female wolverines, especially during that denning time could be you know, anywhere from the start of January um, and through through May, really, when they're most vulnerable. And, and they, they really do not do well with disturbance close to their, their den sites. They will move, move kits um, if, if, yeah, if someone skis or snowmobiles by their spot, they're gonna need to move. Are they an endangered species? Um, uh, they're not an endangered species. Uh, they're uh, a federally endangered species. Some different states have different classifications um, for wolverines, like threatened in Oregon. They're a threatened species, a state threatened species. And, um, and there was a recent um, withdrawal to list the wolverine as threatened for the federal endangered, endangered species. Yeah. No, yeah, threatened yes, yes, for uh, the Federal Endangered Species Act. And um, and so that was, uh, they were originally proposed for listing because of threats uh, to um, their reproduction from climate change. So that's the, the decreasing snowpack um, affecting their denning habitat. Um, and also um, they were uh, thought to be a distinct population segment in the lower 48, but um, the, the decision to withdraw that proposal was based off of um, Wolverines may in the Valor 48 may just be an extension of Canadian populations. And so that does not make them a distinct population segment in the US. Um, and also um, new modeling that finds that certain Wolverine habitat in the Rockies may be less vulnerable to climate effects. But um, uh, I guess our, our personal opinion on that is, is that the threats are still very much there and understudied. Um, and so even if in certain places um, that persistent snowpack will be, um, will last a little longer with the current trajectory trajectory of climate change and the culture that surrounds, um, that surrounds creating change for, um, that would uh, kind of, that would stop climate change. Um, those problems are going to persist for wolverines and um, in the lower 48, where they are very frag, their populations are very fragmented. Um, there are some some serious threats that we need to address still, regardless of um, federal classification of threatened status. Yeah, definitely. So, what is the family structure of the wolverine like? Mm. Yeah, so wolverines were originally thought to um, traditionally thought to be. Uh, very um, solo, completely solo. And so um, studies in Glacier National Park um, in the early 2000s pioneered the, the thinking that um, uh, wolverines might be more social and have like functional family unit, units than, um, than was originally thought. And so th that study uh, found that um, juvenile wolverines were being tolerated within their parents' territories for um, longer than expected. Um, and so there was some paternal care, some, uh, some wolverine dads that were um, being documented um, visiting den sites and, um, and kind of like expect, uh, the thinking was that they, since the young were following them, they had GPS collars that were being tracked. Um, the males and the offspring were being tracked traveling together so there may be some like teaching of hunting and scavenging behavior and, <laughs> that's yeah. so sweet yeah passing on the knowledge i like that yeah. <laughs> uh, okay so my the next question i have here does the wolverine have a natural enemy mm, that's a good question um they they are definitely uh, in in most places in most natural ecosystems they're they're not an apex predator so they do get preyed upon by cougars uh, and by wolves uh, maybe bears in some instances I mean it, a lot of those interactions are going to involve uh, around carcasses and, and food resources so competing with wolves for for carcasses which is also it's it's uh, it's kind of an interesting relationship because wolverines do well in areas 
where there are wolves because there's more carcasses on the landscape and more of those food resources. But then there's more more points of contention and, and wolves will kill wolverines if they find them out in the open type of thing. Oh, gosh. Okay. <laughs> I mean, everybody's got to have an enemy, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. But wolverines, you know, they, they can dig down and they'll they'll hang out in snow holes uh, to hide from other, other predators or they can, yeah, climb trees if they need to. Does that hide their scent when they pack snow or when they dig down into a snow hole? No, I I'd imagine say, that it wouldn't. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, still tr follow their, you know, scent along their tracks and stuff. Yeah, wolverines have a, um, mm. a reputation for being a little stinky, so, um, and um, scent marking, mm -hmm. like male scent marking and throughout their, their home ranges, and so, um, yeah. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> gotcha. How big are wolverines when they are born? Mm. Oh gosh, yeah, I guess we don't know how, like how exactly. Is. <laughs> tiny. <laughs> tiny and they're, they're born completely white. Um, really? Yeah, yeah. That's so cute, okay. Yeah, they look like tiny polar bears. <laughs> That's hilarious. All right, um, I I think we're, we're, we're gonna have to wrap up here. Um, I guess my last question for you is with, um, I guess with the pop culture of Wolverine, the DC or Marvel character, I'm not too savvy with that, but with the comic book character Wolverine being really popular and um, I guess, you know, in literature, people being more aware of the idea of a Wolverine, what do you guys have that you, that, that you would like to give to people to take away from knowing about Wolverines? Yeah, oh, that's a great question. I think that just just that they're they're not a threat to humans at all. I mean, you, you tell people what we're doing, and man, aren't they dangerous? It's like no, they, there's never been any documented attacks of wolverines attacking humans. Um, so they, but they have such a fierce rep reputation. It's probably carried over from trapping days. You know, when trappers, yeah, they have them in a in a foothold trap. They have wolverines have kind of a pretty extreme way of of freaking out, you know, I mean, they need to, they need to compete at carcasses with larger carnivores, sometimes bears, wolves. And so they can look pretty, pretty nasty and mean when they want to, but they're, they're no threat to humans. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Kayla, do you have anything to add? Anything that you would want people to take away about Wolverines? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's great that um, the, the name Wolverine is like present in pop culture to get people like exposed or interested and think like, wait, what is actually a Wolverine? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so I, I just love sharing information about Wolverines and people realizing that they're um, a really endearing species like these, um, the, the incredible feats that they, um, that just like surviving in these harsh mm -hmm. environments, harsh, cold winter environments, and having huge home ranges of over 500 square miles in some cases. That's that's just so impressive. And the, the way they're able to survive and the tenacity of these big, just long term, long distance dispersal events are just, it's, yeah, there's so many things that are very unique and endearing about Wolverines. And um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I um, thanks again for answering all those questions for us. I know that there are a few that we weren't able to get to. And for anybody who has any uh, questions unanswered in our chat too, maybe next time you guys are back from the field, we could do a follow-up follow up Q&A or, or something like that. Sure. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. Cool. Yeah. And in the meantime, yeah, feel free to reach out. We, we have an email, Wolverines at gmail.com yes. <laughs> and then we have an instagram page as well allow wolverine project and so please reach out to us we love talking about wolverines um and if you see wolverines or tracks take good photos of them yes definitely you can submit those to us as well give them to uh scott and kayla i'll put your information here in the chat here in a second um, i do want to say thank you again so much both of you for um, your time and your knowledge on this topic of course and your continued research efforts for us um, i know it's a huge feat to go out there and to collect this data and i'm so thrilled that we have people that are interested and dedicated like you are so thank you so much and um, thank you everybody who was able to join us here today for our discussion you may have noticed that we'll be releasing community conservation episodes monthly with wide-ranging topics on organ conservation so this discussion is going to be recorded and released and is also going to be available on our website so a link for this discussion will be emailed to you with the email that you registered for so please we want you to share 
and um, ask more people to join and get in on the conservation. And if you want to know more about Stormy, if you want more Stormy content, be sure to subscribe to our newsletter. I'll put the link here uh, in our chat as well so that you can subscribe to our newsletter and get updates about work and conservation. Also, donating this time of year is great, especially in somebody's name that makes a great gift or stocking stuffer for this time of year. We also have perks for you that you can receive at different giving levels when you donate between now and December 31st. You can get cool things like um, our newly designed hats. We have hats here. We have stickers with our new, um, our new animal artwork on it, and then also we have tote bags that fold up into each other that are reusable. So those are available at different giving levels. Um, I will put the um, donation link in our chat as well for us. You'll also receive 20% off at our gift store, Spruce Gifts and Provisions. They're located now in downtown Hood River and also online at sprucegiftsandprovisions.com. So, um, and lastly, I do wanna mention that our Safe Passage campaign is coming to you in the way of this beautiful license plate, Watch for Wildlife, you may have seen it before. This is our proposed new license plate for the state of Oregon and all of the plate sales come back to us. They do not go to the state and they specifically go to fund habitat connectivity projects. You can learn more about that um, in our website that's listed below and I'll also put the Watch for Wildlife license plate link in the chat. You can actually pre-order yours today, also makes a very good gift. So anyways, that's all I have. And thank you so much for joining us. I'll catch you next time.